welcome to In Progress, a podcast to help you grow and learn how to become a better version of yourself. Now, here's your host, Michael Cerigliano. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of In Progress. I'm your host, Michael Cerigliano, with special guest and professional musician, Marco Cerigliano. How are you doing today, Marco? Beautiful. Loving my life. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. So... For those of you that don't know, Marco is a professional musician. He's a professional drummer. Um, You can look him up on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, everything. Uh, He's out there with all his music, his drumming and everything. Uh, What do you got going on now? What's new with you? Um, What's going on with me? Uh, So much is going on with me right now. I mean, might as well describe the location we're in as well. We're in... Wicked Squid Studios in Rochester, New York right now, a.k.a. my house as well. It's kind of a double-layer thing. So me and Michael were just hanging out upstairs where I live with four other musicians. Um, We were literally just watching Lord of the Rings. And then this has been planned for a little while now. We finally got it scheduled out to where we could do it in person. It was going to be over, was it Zoom? Zoom? Yeah, we were going to do it over Zoom. But this is a lot better, I feel like. More it's natural. More, yeah, more natural, more personal. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the studio space makes for a better episode anyway. It's a beautiful environment. I like the little backdrop. It looks very authentic. And it's it's very fitting to the theme of the episode as well. But, yeah, so what's new in my life, I'm blessed enough to be living in the same building as a music studio to where, like, usually right now, um, I would be practicing in that room over there. Um Living here, I, I have the the pleasure of being able to bring a whole drum set down here uh, after business hours, which is usually 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., and then I'll be practicing over there. So Michael stayed up. He kicked it with me. We got our energy drinks ready to go on deck. And That's right. It's 1 in the morning right now or almost 2. Yeah. We stayed up late for this shit. We watched Lord of the Rings. Absolutely. Right here. So... Yeah, that's that's uh, a really cool part of my life right now. I recorded my debut album here. Um, that's on all platforms, and that's actually the intro and outro to In Progress. That's right. He he is the person responsible for the intro and the outro that you hear on every episode. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm just playing. No, but so it was recorded in here. Beautiful. Uh, my 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 brother, my boy Birdman, and my roommate. And bandmate, so much. A Birdman, uh, we sat here and engineered the record for so many hours. It's countless. We, we we recorded here, mixed it, and mastered it all in this building. So this building is so special to me. And here we are. Michael was talking to me, asking me where we should do the interview. And this place is so special to me. And it's the perfect spot. And so it was worth the wait. And here we are in it. Um, other than that, I'm in several bands. Uh in the Rochester area right now, as well as like some New York City Buffalo Cats that I'm, I got some projects with. Um, and yeah, I mean, the long and short of it all is that I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be at a point in my life where I'm a full-time musician, making all of my money through performing music strictly. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly how I want it to be. I, I didn't want to be, I want to be very selective with my teaching. Like I don't want to, I don't want to, in my life right now, especially at my age, I'm 24. I don't mm-hmm. want to be too invested in teaching. I want to. I want to. I want to come back around to teaching, probably after 30s. Yeah. I want to be able to practice as much as I can, study as much as I can, and perform as much as I can. Because I'm like, I'm not at my peak, but like I'm. I'm right at the perfect age to where, you know, I can like, I can do crazy shit and I can go around and like everything is. It's it's young energy, and then when I'm when I'm a little older and like a little more relaxed, then I can uh, I can chill out, settle down, probably take up more teaching and perform mm. a little bit less. <laughs> but right now, I I want it set up to where I can perform only if possible, which right. I'm doing. I have, exactly. I currently have no students, which is sick, and I'm making all my money through performing. So that's fantastic. I know for a while you were you were doing uh, students and teaching and stuff like that. What took you? What kind of pulled you away from that? Was that just like full? like 100% into just performing yeah it was it was so check this out because like you're a businessman yourself so mm-hmm. um I where did I hear this I don't know if it was Gary V or like Grant Cardone or one of those cats yeah but they were talking about so this is what it is I don't know who it was but it's a, this is an interesting concept and I love it and this is what I did I implemented this into my teaching it's like you you have your price and then your amount of students and it's like 
as your price goes up, the amount of students will decrease. Right. And I have my price set to the perfect point to where somebody who's taking it very seriously would pay that amount of money, mm. maybe even just one time. But I understand the worth of my time and my knowledge and all of that. Nonetheless, I don't want to be teaching that much. If I right. wanted to, I would lower my price and gain the students. It's like, it's like a seesaw. Like, the lower your price, the more students. The higher your price, the less students. So exactly. I have my price set to a nice point to where I'll get the occasional one, two lessons a month. Yeah. Um, but no more than that. And mm. if I start to, like, if the students start to come up, I just raise the price. Okay. And then the students come back down. So I can control how much of students I have based on the price. So right now I have it set that way, and and that's why I went from having a lot of students to to having fewer students. It's like now I can focus more on my own practice, and it's like that's where my mind uh, has to be at this point in my life. Absolutely. If you're pursuing if you're pursuing performing, you definitely got to do that. But um, is there going to be a point in time when you lower your price to supplement in um, lessons, or are you going to keep your price where it's at and just? focus on maybe like advertising lessons more yeah that's that's exactly it i don't think i would lower my price unless i do lower my price for people who i meet in person like if somebody meets me at a show and we vibe out really well we have a nice conversation and i learn about them and i see like potential and i see not not only potential in their playing but potential in their mindset like mm -hmm. that's huge too like i don't want to teach somebody who's not going to take it seriously which is why the price is where it is right so if i talk to somebody and i'm like oh oh damn like your mindset is you have you you can tell when somebody has it versus when somebody doesn't. Right, exactly. And if somebody even by the eye contact of somebody, like someone's like, yeah, you know, I I I I, I uh, you know, I just want to get a little better in, in my playing. I don't know. And it's like compared to somebody who's like, he's like, I'm so serious about this. I practice this much a day, and and I just I know that through your knowledge you can take me to the next level. I'd be like, like that's a powerful sentence in itself. So Absolutely. I'd be like, I'd be like, okay, cool. Well, my price is this. What's like like and then honestly we can work with it and meet meet where it's good for you because helping others would be would come before the price period right exactly period right? so you're willing to negotiate on the price depending on the seriousness of the student you have seriousness of the student and the relationship as well like if you're a homie and you want to take a lesson as well I will lower my price because I don't want to just like default you you're the homie so and that goes for for anybody too right you know <clears throat> but so anyway um, with the performing. So you're focusing 100% on performing right now, or, well, 99%. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Uh, so what are you doing? Because I know you practice a shit ton. Mm -hmm. What Do you have a practice schedule that you're hitting on a daily basis, or is it more so just I'm trying to fit in practice anywhere I can no matter what? Yeah, so it used to be the first, and now it's more so the second. So it used to be, like, back when uh, we were on Fiesta Road, mm -hmm. And uh, I was practicing in the basement, which is crazy to think about, like, our parents dealing with the drumming for that long. I thought yeah. about that recently. It's crazy. Like, right? That like, shit rumbled the house. Yeah, that's insane to me. And I never processed it like that until recently. And I'm like, wow. Like, they were really... Ch and that made me gain respect for them. It's like, damn, they were really chilling up there with, like, symbols. And it's, like, just, like, watching TV and like just patient as fuck that, that's that's another level of patience but, absolutely but back on fiesta road uh it was like two to four p.m practice double bass patterns four to six p.m uh write out a transcription six to eight p.m play the transcription eight to ten p.m jazz brushes mm -hmm. right it was very regimented and and i would rake up hours just by doing it like that and that's like the that's the most optimal optimal way to practice, in my opinion. To 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 sketch it out like that. Like I'm reading a book right now, called "Effective Practicing for Musicians" by Benny Greb, mm. and in that book he talks about how, if you schedule a, this goes for anything, not only practicing a music instrument, but like for example, even this even this podcast will say how you have like a rough draft per episode. Yeah, it's like. When you have an idea of what you're going to do before you get there, it flows out more naturally and you make more use of your time. Exactly. Rather you're than not just thinking of what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. You know what you're about to do and then it gives you that ab ability to kind of figure things out in that mm -hmm. while you're doing it. Kind of like conversation we're having. Exactly, like yeah. I li and I like, I like it like this a lot recently. It's like what we're doing right now is, like I just said, more like jazz. Except for you said it's on the beat. Jazz <laughs> isn't on the beat. No, but, but I like it better this way now, which is how I approach it now. But So it was more regimented back then, and that's better for if you're trying to accomplish more when you're practicing. Now how I approach it is the, way you, the second way you just said, which mm. is I'll be literally, let's say I have a rehearsal at 
um, like five to eight. That's a rehearsal. I understand that I'm gonna be up till six or seven in the morning. So I'm gonna wake up around noon, and then I'll I'll, I'll probably eat something and I'll practice from one p.m. to three p.m. Mm. And there I just got in two hours, one to two, two to three. Right. I got two hours right there on a pad. Then I hit rehearsal on the set from five to eight, and then like that's three hours right there. And then I get back home. I can hit maybe two hour, two more hours on the pad, mm -hmm. and then I can at two a.m. when the studio sessions are done, I can set up in here and hit two hours on the real kit. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, what? How much do I get? Well, I got seven hours before I hit the real kit. Seven hours. Yeah. And that goes to show like how easily you can rake up your hours where if you just fit it in where you can get it in. Absolutely. That's when you're a full-time musician and you're like privileged enough to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But so that's how I approach it more so now. It's like wherever the gaps are in my day. It's messed up because it doesn't it 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 doesn't allow me to achieve a lot other other than practicing and getting better, but like that's kind of what I want at this point. But right. every free moment that I have in the day, if I'm not practicing or studying, I feel like I'm wasting it. I'm at that point. So which is a phenomenal mindset to have, though. It is, it is, and it isn't because it is because you achieve way more. And you're putting in more hours. And now I'm at the point where I'm, like, logging all my hours. And you know that. You yeah. see my, my, my planner. So I'm logging in every week the hours I have. And then, like, on the back page of it, it'll be the hours total for the year. Or or in general. I'm logging my hours right now. I'm at 1,600. Um, I'm logging until I get to 10,000. And then probably still going. But I want to see how long it takes me to get to 10,000 hours. Cause mm. What are you at right now? When, uh, I'm at 1,600. So, like, roughly. For so, the year? 1,650 since I started logging. Which okay. was... A little over a year ago. I think I started logging in October of 2021. Mm. 2020. Yeah. October of 2020. And then, yeah. So a little over yep. a year. A little over a year now. So I'm at 1,600. And I'm surprised. I thought I'd be at more. Mm -hmm. But it's like you'll have your weeks where you hit 50. And then your weeks where you hit 20. Right. And it just fluctuates that rapidly. Based on your schedule and shit like that. Exactly. So, um, Yeah. That's where that's that's what I'm doing right now, and I'm focusing on getting the hours up, and just getting 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 my practice and the time with my instrument up, and it's transformed from a more theoretical point into a more spiritual point of playing. Mm -hmm. So now, like there's a there, there's there's your music theory books where it's like, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to translate it to other than music. So it's like studying a history book, mm -hmm. right? Studying a history book on um, let me think. What's a good metaphor? Cause like music, cooking. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, so like cooking. You study a cookbook, <clears throat> and it's like you stay. You you start there, mm -hmm. and you you're so like you're following the exact instructions to a T. To a T. Yeah. And then you turn it to an Italian old lady, and you're just <laughs> like putting in like a like you know not using measuring cups anymore. Yeah, exactly. And it's more of a feeling, and so. You get to the point in your in your in your journey as a musician or in anything period a soccer player a basketball player um an engineer like a cook like like we're saying it's like yeah. you get to a point to where you go from uh you're so regimented and scholastic with your approach yeah and it it kind of lacks a little bit of soul mm -hmm. to the point where it's almost entirely feeling and it's a part of you and you're able to speak through that craft of whatever yeah. it is exactly and so that's where I am now. And I've noticed that now I'm not focused on growing necessarily my theoretical chops. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on growing my spiritual chops. There's a right. book I'm reading called The Mysticism of Sound and Music, where it's a Sufi Muslim explaining different aspects of music and how it embodies the spirituality of it and how in some religions they use music as meditation and prayer. So that's where my mindset is. And I'm able to truly connect with my instrument much more through just that. Right, exactly. You know what I'm saying? You're able to actually portray who you are as a person through your instrument now as opposed to just hitting the like black and white mm -hmm. like drum beats and exactly. different shit. Yeah, exactly what you just said. You're able to express who you are as a person. So mm -hmm. it's like the black and white would be like I have the groove transcribed. It's like it's like cut cut. It's like that's not you. That's a that's a written pattern. Yeah, exactly. Compared to there's it's robotic. Some, it's very robotic, mm -hmm. but that's part of who you are. So check this out. This is interesting. In the book, the mysticism, the mysticism of sound and music that I was mm -hmm. just talking about, you said you express who you are as a musician. Mm -hmm. And so, in the book, there's something that I highlighted and I took a note of, 
that literally your music, your musical instrument is, your, uh, is, it's a way to express your voice of who you are. Yeah. Because what, what do you tell when you're genuinely expressing yourself through your instrument is your past, your present, and your future, mm -hmm. where you're going. So it's like my past would be the, the black and white, mm -hmm. got, mm -hmm. got, that's my past. Yeah. And I can chill there whenever I want to. Now my present is what I'm, where I currently am in my life with all of my influences from the past to this very moment, and that's who I am. And, and, my, and my personality is mm -hmm. gonna show through that. And then my future that I'm telling is anything that I'm going for that's out, just out of reach and I might even mess it up, but that's my future because that's where my mind is thinking, but my body can't quite play it yet. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like, you go from the black and white to actually expressing like genuinely who you are as a person, like as a full embodiment. Exactly. So when did you notice that that change happened? Like, did you notice that that change happened or was it like one day it was kind of like, oh shit? Yeah. Uh, when did I notice that change happened was- Like, was it like a set thing where it's like, you were playing one day and you're like, okay damn or was it more so like over time you're just noticing oh damn i'm just like easily running through these basic rudimentary shit and now i'm like throwing some flair into it yeah i think it's more the f more the first way i want to say so you actually noticed the difference like yeah. when it happened yeah was it something you consciously did or was it just something that happened like a pokemon evolving it just fucking <laughs> happened it was i think it was something i conscious i think it was a little bit of both i consciously did it because when i started studying spirituality Mm -hmm. And I started tapping into actually becoming a good human being, like in, like n regardless of the instrument. Mm -hmm. When I started being a more peaceful person, and I started like forgiving everybody in my head and in my in my mind who's wronged me or whatever. Yeah, I forgave everybody. I became at peace. I started studying a little bit of Buddhism and uh, Taoism, and, mm -hmm. and 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 I and I started searching more into myself and growing myself as a person mm -hmm. rather than just like be forgetting about all that and just like only focusing on my instrument. Once I focused on myself and I started growing myself and I noticed that and I noticed my my attitude, oh, it, my attitude changed in life and I, and I currently am there where I operate on 99% positivity, I say, like every day of my life. I wake yeah. up and it's just like, you're so, in, you wake up inspired, you automatically have it in you. It's fucking Absolutely. beautiful. Like so, and it's because the life I live, I've, I live in a fucking studio and I do music full time. It's right. like zooming out and seeing that like, and then thinking of myself as a child, like, like when we were younger and I'm just like, just practicing and just like, you know, and like thinking of where I started, like, it like makes me so emotional. And so like to see where I am, I can zoom out and be like, like you're not in LA, you're not in New York City, but you're working every day to become the greatest you can be. And you have the opportunity to do that and the privilege to do that all day, every day. And it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's like, you can't be mad. Like, no. Somebody stole my catalytic converter in this parking lot like two weeks ago, and it's like... I just, oh, really? Yeah. We live, uh, in a, we, live in a, we live in a kind of sketchy area in Rochester. But it's fine, because, like, I just got to replace the day of, quick hundred dollars, whatever, and, like, I'm, I'm back to it. It's like, that's a little minuscule thing. Like, zoom out in life, and it's like, it's beautiful. The fact that... Absolutely. The fact that I don't have to sweat a repair like that, and I'm a full-time musician, mm -hmm. another reason to be happy. So, yeah. I noticed there was a point in my life where I, I forgave everybody and everything, and... I started learning more about myself and, and, and the inner workings of myself mm -hmm. and studying more spirituality because yeah. I think it started with the hard work and the hard work translated into more spirituality and love and, and, and it's, it's both still but when the spirituality and love kicked in that's when I noticed that okay now I'm not just kind of like, open up to everything yeah more it, so your mind your spirit your heart exactly. it opens up all the way and yeah. so when I started doing that I didn't notice it quite yet but when I started noticing, damn, I'm like operating every day. I'm like, I'm very positive. Whoever I talk to, like a smile on their face, like just like breathing love, radiating positivity. And it's like just being around me. You're going to feel much better about yourself because you're going to be calmer. Everything's going to slow down mm -hmm. and you're going to feel comfortable. And I'm, I, I'm never going to speak negativity. I'm not going to talk shit. Like, I might joke around with the bros or whatever. Yeah. And even that is, like, sparse because I want to truly inspire. I want, like, every word that leaves my mouth to be inspirational or positive. Right, exactly. In order for everybody around me to be at the top of their game as well. Right, you want to bring everybody to that level. Exactly, yeah. And surround yourself with greatness. Mm -hmm. And we all just grow together like kings, and it's beautiful. So, yeah. like, operating like that, once I got into that mindset, 
and like I'm truly happy, I started realizing, damn, like I can I feel like I'm speaking through my instrument now. I don't feel like I'm like recalling a rudiment or recalling a certain phrase I memorized and then spitting it out. Now I feel like I'm genuinely speaking through my instrument. And it's weird how life translates to music just like that. But when I started focusing on myself, I started realizing my relationship with my instrument was much more spiritual mm -hmm. and much less scholastic. Right, exactly. Which is honestly, as a musician, that's kind of where you want to be. Whether it's drumming, guitar, even vocals. Yeah. You want your, your whatever you're doing, artistically, whatever. I mean, no matter what, musically, this, like anything, yes, you I'm want it say. to be... You want it to be a portrayal of who you are as a person, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, oh, he's just running through the, running through the basics. He, he's just doing what he's supposed to be doing. Whereas right. like with you, like if I come and watch you perform, you're not drumming the same way the next guy is drumming. You have your own flair, your own spice to it, which is what makes you entertaining to watch and listen to. Mm -hmm. And that just goes for anybody doing anything. Yes. You want to be able to get to a point where. And this, this is almost, I feel like, where the spirituality comes into it. And um, I had, I had uh, you, you're, you're familiar with Pat, right? Pat Collins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had him on the podcast two episodes ago. And we were talking about stoicism. Yes. I love that. And uh, he was saying, and we were talking about how with a, with a stoic mentality, nothing phases you. He was, he was referring to a person who is practicing stoicism, who, who is stoic, a stoic yeah. person as yeah. a statue, an immovable object. Mm -hmm. So, like, anything that comes your way, negativity-wise, yeah. like, it, it doesn't phase you. Mm -mm. And that type of mentality is almost freeing, in a sense, where it's like, it doesn't matter what other people think. At the end of the day, I'm doing what makes me happy. Mm -hmm. And that ends up actually coming out better in whatever you're doing. Yeah. So, like, with you drumming, instead of worrying about, like, oh, there's, like, these old heads who are, like, saying, oh, he's too... He's too flashy on the drums he, he's not supposed to be doing that he's stupid and i know that happens mm -hmm. you're just like fuck it i'm gonna let my playing talk for me yeah and same thing with me doing this like this is obviously like a big fucking like weird as fuck like a lot of people to an old head yeah not even to an old head but like just from who i was as a person versus who i am as a person mm -hmm. like 18 19 20 21 year old michael would have never thought oh Michael's going to be on the internet talking to people about spirituality, growth, entrepreneurial shit. Like, never. Not literally a year ago, I couldn't have even, like, thought this was going to happen. Yeah. At all. It was actually after the conversation that I had with you mm -hmm. that made me jump into this. So, thank you for that. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, like, circling back to what we were talking before, like, that's what you are. Like people like we were talking about sociology too right you t you you talk you put me onto that word mm. i i realized that i studied this but you put me onto that word you've mastered the art of communication and like people yeah you know like how i'm studying my instrument you've studied actual like real life conversations and understanding people yeah and so you're at the point to where you can study conversations and you can study how to flow through it and shit and how mm -hmm. to tag along to the end of this yeah the cadence like, and everything behind it yeah. yeah but you're not thinking like that anymore now you're just flowing and you're able to have like the most interesting conversations with anybody yeah of anything like you were talking about nfts talking about spirituality talking about substance abuse and like getting away from that and everything and now we're talking about music and it's like you have mastered the art of a conversation to where you can talk very deeply about any topic with anybody mm -hmm. just by understanding how to talk to somebody mm -hmm. and then it just naturally flows out and it's not like calculated like you don't have a notepad with you where you're like okay i have my questions here and like like some people do that and it's like yeah you know, that's how i started yeah and it's like nothing's wrong with that but no. when you get to the point to where you can just paperlessly flow mm -hmm. joe rogan has got to be like the goat of oh podcasts, that's right? yeah that's god level that's god level yeah joe rogan <laughs> he uh did you listen to the podcast joe rogan had with snoop dogg i listened to clips of it but not the whole thing absolutely insane so when i was <laughs> driving dog. when i was driving up from texas i was actually driving up from cincinnati at the time and joe rogan's podcasts notoriously are long as fuck very long so him and snoop dogg like i was listening to the one with him and a uh one of the founders slash researchers of the mRNA technology and the vaccine. Um, that was like an hour and a half, two hour podcast. Cool. Him and Snoop literally chopped it up for like three and a half hours. <laughs> no fucking joke. And it's crazy because 
and that that's the level that I'm trying to get to. And with practice, it obviously will happen. Yeah. Um, but he, because with me, if there's a natural ending to a conversation, I'm almost always going to take it in lieu of having the conversation become awkward. That's like, I will recognize the out and take it. Okay. But Joe Rogan holds the awkwardness. And that's a level of interpersonal communication. So, for example, say me and you were talking, right? Okay. And where, you know, like, oh, yeah, the, you know, I'm practicing the drums, da 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 He'll sit in that. Mm. He'll sit in that silence for a minute. <laughs> and he'll make the, either make the other person talk or be able to just pick up. And it's, it, the way he picks it up is like that 30 second pause never happened. Interesting. And it's wild. But his, his communication skills are that, that good. Wow. Like he's able to Fast have those conversations. Yeah, exactly. He's able to have those dramatic pauses where it's not awkward. And that's something that is the same thing as drumming. There's a cadence to everything. Mm-hmm. And in communication with people, that pause holds a lot of value. And it, it actually expresses your value. That you're not worried about filling the gap. Yeah. You're able to sit in that aw- awkward silence. And that's something that I had to learn in... I mean, I come from the sales background. Yeah. Where I had to learn how to do it for sales. And then me and you, we learned how to communicate soci- like sociology. Like, yeah. talking to people. Mm-hmm. And that's where I actually started, like, writing... Like, writing... Taking notes and yeah. practicing it. And I had, the, I had the blessing to be able to implement it in a sales environment where I have no choice but to talk to 30, 40, 50 people a day that I have no idea who they are, and they're all coming in for a different thing. So I had the ability to practice it, and now it's at a point where, like you said, like we said, you don't care what another person thinks, and it shows in the conversation, and it makes it so that no matter what happens, the conversation's a good conversation. Yeah. And that's how I feel like your drumming is, where... No matter what you're doing, like I know you were up there and you were saying how you, you didn't, well, it's not called being offbeat, but like, what's it called? Um, um, are you talking about syncopated, like on the offbeats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you said that you were playing with uh, Mike. Yes. And you hit, an, what is it? You were, A syncopation beat. I hit the upbeat. Yeah. Right? So you changed it. Okay, yeah. But like you, you played it so well, nobody recognized it. It's not like, and like you played it off well. Uh-huh. So like nobody recognized it at all, right. like nobody. Yeah. Um. I know. I mean, obviously, if you have musical musical ear, you could recognize it. Like Sage said, he recognized it. Mm-hmm. But like, to the person who doesn't know, like I was listening, I was like, he's killing it. He's yeah, fucking exactly. kill. Whatever happened, he's killing it. Yeah. And then the thing is, the communication, the nonverbal communication between the musicians, so you and Mike and Evan, Evan, mm-hmm. that happened. You all recognize it happened. Yep. You all played it off the same way to exactly. make it fall back in the pocket. Yeah. Or what, well, you guys it was all improv, so I guess there really is no pocket. And that's like communication too. It's like I'll do I'll do something like that, and then like, let's say like we're chilling in the groove just for an example purpose for people who are listening. They don't understand what it is. It's like, so like if we're chilling in the groove like. Like it feels. Like it changed, but we're still, like we're all still feeling that. But when I switch it up to this, I'll be like, oh, 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 oh. Oh. we'll all look at each other and smirk like it's a joke. Mm. So that's like a musical joke. Yeah. And so when you change the feel of it, but you could still feel it in the original way. Yeah. But like I change the feel. So like you hear that other feel, but you're still in that feel and you look over and you're like, like you just look over and you're like. <laughs> like bro like are you kidding me it's like literally telling a joke and like the punchline is coming back to the original feel mm. and it's like alright cool we're back in it like, and it's like that was just a little side step and it's just shit like that is so interesting to me too so yeah like that's how music can be communication as well now is, is the um, is what you're explaining right now is that a, an example of your your person your soul coming out in the music 1000% so is that something that you for example wouldn't have done early on in your drumming career yeah i wasn't skilled enough to be confident enough to do that like like you said being confident enough to take a pause you feel that though right and bask in the tension yeah 
You feel that. You feel that. It's an energy. Not a lot of people can sit. Exactly. I like that's one of my favorite things to do recently in conversation too. Just Mm -hmm. be like, we're talking, and it's like super chill. It's super chill, and then and this is cool to learn about learn a lot about another person. So we're we're chilling, and we get to the point to where we're actually like comfortably chilling. Mm -hmm. And then the conversation, like I can even like point it out and be like, all right, now like let's not talk and just like look at me. And it's like you learn a lot about a person just from like are they wavering eye contact, which is like hilarious. We both can laugh about that. Mm-hmm. Or like are you like stone cold looking at me? I'm like, damn. That says a lot about even confidence as a whole. Absolutely. Like about yourself and about the other person too. Like if I if I if I'm confident, but maybe I like don't trust you or I don't vibe you or I don't or I don't want you to access my soul, I'm going to I'm like and you do the thing where you look at me, I'm gonna be like I can't trust you to look into my eyes. You're going to learn too much about me, right? Mm-hmm. That's how some people view it as well. But for the people who have, like, unwavering confidence and, like, you just, like, just a strong personality, like you just did. Like, you can, we can look at each other, no words, and we just grill each other for, like, a little bit. And it's, like, you learn a lot about a person through no words and no talking. Absolutely. What I implemented into my drumming recently as well, I'm learning a lot about the art of soloing. Um, and it's, like, in a solo, people want to take up space. But I've learned how to literally not play anything. There's a clip of me doing a solo recently where I was like I'm doing a I'm doing a groove and then I do nothing but uh but movement. So it'd be like the like what it what it was was like it was like uh 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 And I'm not playing anything, but I'm doing this and I move my head and they feel it. Okay, and like people, whoa! Absolutely. Oh my God, he just wasn't playing anything, and that'd be like if I was talking. And you know, I'm still talking, but no words are coming out. So it's mm-hmm. like, what? The, like the sound went out. The sound went out. It looked like it didn't go out. Comes back in. Yeah. And that's like, that's like, if 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 this is Coca Cola, then this. Is like Diet Coke, respectfully. Be a gentleman. Preference based. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> that's circling back to the whole conversational thing. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring it, bring it back to you practicing, you mm-hmm. practicing, you pursuing drums. Obviously, drums, really anything artistically, for the most part, is not going to be viewed by anyone as a solid means to make money a solid means of a career what helped you continue to pursue drums even in the dark times when i mean i know when COVID hit drumming was non-existent gigs were non-existent what helped you push through for the people that are maybe pursuing something their own and they're in a position where maybe things aren't hitting the way that they want them to be hitting or sales aren't happening, or uh, views aren't happening. What helped you drive through that dark period to get to the point where you're at now, where you're gigging constantly, and your ma- your only source of income is gigging and playing the drums? Mm-hmm. What kept you alive in that time? Interesting. That's a great question. Um, I never really thought of it like that, but I feel like two traits that helped me in that time, like... If you consider Darwinism a trait, like the ability to adapt to change, yeah, and continue forth, you you adapt and you and you bask in the uncomfortableness until you're comfortable. Mm-hmm. Darwinism and my work ethic that I've solidified, thankfully, and and now I have my work. At, I've studying cats like David Goggins, Gary V, Conor McGregor, Kobe Bryant, Floyd Mayweather. It's like all of these people's work ethic is insane, Wild. and I've downloaded it into my mind to where I have like a little any one of them at any moment. Like, so the voice is in your head instead of being you only. Mm-hmm. It's you, Kobe jumps in. Yes. Michael Connor Jordan. jumps in. Yeah, exactly. Like so and that's the thing too with a lot of people. Just a quick side note, because I love like tying it back to mental health and yeah, spirituality and inspiration. Mm-hmm. So like the work ethic voice is in my head. And then I have like spirituality voices in my head. And all of them are positive and encouraging. Yeah. A lot of people who who tell me um, like they feel depressed or they have 
they're not feeling too well about themselves. The voices in their head are negative. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, and I've finally got it to the point, and this is why I feel 99% happy all the time. I've got to the point where the only voices in my head are positive and encouraging. Mm. And I'm constantly, like, I walk by a mirror, I look at myself, it's all positive and encouraging. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm working, even if I mess something up, working as in, like, practicing. Yeah. I'm practicing and I mess something up. It's like, what I don't, what, you can think two things. Mm. And what I think is the second thing. The first thing most people would think is you mess up and you're like, oh, you idiot, you suck. I can't believe you would fuck that up. Mm. The second thing, which is what I think is, yes, yes. Like, you can't do that. So here's an opportunity to grow. Like, let's jump on this and let's just, like, really take it under a microscope and just and just dissect it until you've mastered every edge of it. And then, boom, you have it in the arsenal, muscle memory. Mm. Don't even have to think about it. So next time you just you just hit you get to it and you don't even got to think about it it's subconscious it is not conscious yeah exactly. most things that are conscious you ha you have a slight chance that you'll fuck them up exactly because you're thinking about what you're doing exactly over and sometimes overthinking and mm -hmm. when it's subconscious it's to the point where you can just play and execute but i'm i'm feel like kanye i'm just riffing <laughs> i'm like no i mean that's that's beautiful that's what i want yeah yeah well that that in itself so um, my work ethic is what I was saying. So Darwinism and my work ethic allowed me to to, to carry through the pandemic. And um, it's partially still going on, but thankfully we're to the point where, speaking of Darwinism, as a community, we've we figured, okay, we're going to wear masks if we're not vaccinated or whatever vaccinated. We don't even have, we don't even have to dive down that rabbit hole during this podcast. Mm -hmm. But we've adapted to, to, to the pandemic as to where I can perform now, even under these circumstances, and I right. still get paid well, and it's like, it's all good. So that's the Darwinism of the venues and the public. Mm -hmm. um, so, pandem uh, so Darwinism and work ethic, two things that got me through the pandemic. And um, Darwinism in the sense of, I'm in a band called the Pickle Mafia, mm -hmm. and at a certain point in the pandemic, we were chopping up pickles for days, like making so many pickles, like just shelves of different flavors of pickles. And that, like I was... Whatever you would call somebody who makes a pickle, a pickleologist or whatever, I was <laughs> like, I, I was that for a short amount of time, and like so, so Charlie would be uh, Charlie's the piano player in Pickle Mafia. Mm -hmm. Charlie uh, would would pay me and Ben. Ben is the bass player, and so we're a trio. Charlie would pay me and Ben to to do like labor, like cut up the pickles, sprinkle it up, and get the ingredients in there right, jar it, label it, and like we were making pickles for for money, like weekly or whatever you know mm -hmm. for for an amount of time yeah i also speaking of lesson prices i lowered my prices like my price was here students were here pandemic hit i lowered my price and i advertised even more which which is a whole nother category like the more you advertise the more students you're gonna have so there's yeah, like so. three categories and so i lowered my price a little bit i advertised way more and i was able to cop way more students so mm. so then it's like okay i can't perform so now i have to teach I adapted to that, and work ethic wise, I was constantly prom promoting the lessons, and I have this practice log that I have, and just flipping through it, you can see all custom like grooves, chops, fills, transcriptions, mm -hmm. and it's like I have all of this knowledge that is nowhere else, like all of this that I just did myself, coming from myself and other great drummers that inspire me. Yeah. So I have all of this information, and you have access to any of it. If you hit me up for a lesson, we do an hour lesson. You tell me you want to hit this. Uh, you saw that I had a transcription of this person. You saw that I was doing grooves in 7-8. And you want to learn more about Odd Time. It's like, okay, I flipped to that page in my book. And I might even catalog you. And whatever you want to do, we can we can hit that and hit the ideas behind it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of how I made it through the pandemic. It's like performing went away. So now it's all about adaptation. And now I'm making pickles part-time, giving lessons part-time. We're going to garage sales. And I did this with Antonio, our little brother. Mm -hmm. uh, going to garage sales, buying stuff like Gary V style. Gary V shit, yeah. Gary V style. He's 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 goaded. Like you're a millionaire, but you're still going to garage sales and picking up this can, this rare can for twenty five cents, and then flipping it because you know that it's worth ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Even like that's that's a that's a crazy return for Absolutely. something that's twenty five cents. I remember uh, we bought uh, a cologne. It was a it was a rare cologne for fifty cents. And then we flipped it for twenty five dollars. Oh really? It's like, it's like what? Like the fact that you can do something like that so easily. How'd you? Did you 
find it, then figure it out, or did you figure it out when you saw it and then bought it? We'd be at the garage sale, and it's like two things. You can you can look at it and see its rarity. That you can look at it and be like, oh, that's a, that looks interesting. That looks vintage. That mm-hmm. looks one of one. It has a look to it. Or, which which is what we did more of because we're not that versed in everything. You look at it and you type in like the exact name of it, and then you search on Google the prices. And then what is it selling for? Oh, they want a dollar for it. But over here on eBay, like this guy has it going for thirty dollars, mm-hmm. and they only want okay. So you buy it, and then you list it for that price, or maybe a little under the price, or maybe over if you want to be risky. But you know, you're gonna you're gonna make more than twenty times what you pay for. Yeah, it. ROI so is wild on something crazy. Like that. Yeah. So so you go and you spend ten dollars at a garage sale, and then you could potentially flip it all to make a few hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So it's like okay, like let's be smart. Like it's. That's 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 another great trait to have, and like I'm I'm pretty stubborn in in the way that I want to only perform yeah. in my life, and that's what I feel my my calling is, partially at least, is to, is to perform and and to express myself self through my instrument and inspire other people, and so that's why I want to perform a lot. I can inspire through teaching easily; it's it's more personal. But right, exactly. Through performing, it's like I'm, I want to reach the peak of my potential, uh, live, like raw. This is just what it is. I want to reach the peak in front of people, and I want people to be in 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 awe and inspired. Not in awe. I don't want to. It's not even an egotistical thing of like, whoa. But like, you know, you see, you can see the work that I put into my instrument through the way I play. Yeah, exactly. And you can see my personality through the way I play too. Like you, you're gonna see me take deep breaths when I'm playing. You're gonna see me calm down. You're gonna see me. Just be insanely Wu Wei, which is a Taoism term for in the zone, in the flow state. You're going to see Wu Wei in action. And if you want to come talk to me after the show, we can talk about it. And like I know me, I watched a drummer at one point um, before a show. I was studying this drummer. Just He was sitting behind his kit. And as a drummer, I could tell a lot about a drummer just by his gear. And so I was watching this dude sit behind his kit. And uh, his name is Joe Tamino. Mm. And I was looking at him behind his kit. And I saw him go like this. He was sitting behind his kit. All the other cats were warming up. He wasn't even really touching his instrument. The sticks were down. He went like this. Then he looked up. Eyes closed. For like one to two minutes, just that. Just he, he got out of the current environment that we're in and his spirit and mind transcended to a whole nother dimension and he mm-hmm. just was able to calm his body and mind down and get into the exact state of mind that he wanted to be in before mm-hmm. the show and so that's where he was and just seeing that alone I don't even gotta watch you play anymore you know really I don't even gotta watch you play anymore that speaks that loudly to you so fucking loud that is so insp- that alone is inspirational to me mm-hmm. seeing that so inspirational to me Like that just gets me so motivated Like you don't even gotta touch your instrument I know you're about to whip ass mm-hmm. I already know Like you don't gotta touch anything Anybody who Before they do it Like They don't go through the The, the, the common routines Like most drummers Before they play a show They'll just be like On a pad Like Paradiddles or whatever para- Paradiddles And they're like Going through the motions It's like mm-hmm. this is common But to see somebody just like Sticks down And just spiritually Go somewhere else mm. And you can feel that Just like Just looking at him I was like I smirked And I was like I'm going to talk to him After about exactly that That's it He he, he killed the performance It was very unique Very creative mm. Exactly what you would expect From somebody who does Something like that Before they perform Right It's like martial arts How like It's like a Bruce Lee approach Bruce Lee is goaded For so many So many quotes And just his approach To martial arts As a whole Yeah But it's it's a it's like a mindset and a spiritual thing rather mm-hmm. than just a routine, you know. I'm working on I'm throwing some jabs before. It's like no, I'm going to like connect with the universe mm-hmm. before I before I perform. Yeah, I don't need to practice or warm up. I'm gonna connect to, with the universe and become one with it. And now I am the vessel that's being spoken through, like a higher power is speaking through me, and using all of my experience and my mind. To translate it through my subconscious mind, through my instrument, or through my art, or through my craft, mm. martial arts, or whatever the case may be, and that's like like there was a video of Michael Phelps before you seen the, that viral video of Phelps with the headphones on mm-hmm. before the swim meet, 
And he just like he's just like he's like this. Oh yeah. Everybody's warming up and he's just like this. His arms are crossed and his headphones are on and he's looking down, closing his eyes. And it's like you're going somewhere else. It's it's kind of like a trait that you see in a lot of people who are I don't want to say goats, but at the top of their craft. At that peak level. Like I said, which is like what I said at the beginning of the podcast. I said it starts scholastically and it elevates to a level where it's spiritual. Yeah. And you get you get to a point where you're so subjectively good. Like, you've been doing it for long enough, and it's, it's so natural to you, to where you're no longer going through the motions to warm up and doing it. Now it's, you don't have to, you can you can do that as well, but now it's a spiritual additive. Mm-hmm. So now I want to connect with the universe before I, before I perform. I want to yeah. connect with the, the whole universe. I want to get my mind into a place where I can calmly, calmly perform in mm-hmm. my instrument, through my instrument to other people and that's when you truly execute the best is when you I I believe truly like you execute whatever you're doing the best when you're calm Mm -hmm. and you can rationally think to where you don't even have to think because it's subconscious exactly I was actually going to ask you um, do you think that 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 act prior to a show prior to a race prior to a game where it's instead of warming up the motion, you're calming yourself down. Do you think that's a good indicator to say that 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 person, whoever that may be, is so confident in what they're about to do or what they know they can do that it's not a let me warm up to make sure I'm on my game. It's a I know I'm on my game. Let me make sure mentally I'm where I want to be. Mm-hmm. That's definitely it. So it's like... When you're able to, you can see a level of, like, almost not give a fuck. Mm -hmm. But you do give a fuck. So, I don't know how to explain it, explain it well enough. But it's like... I mean, you see that even in professional athletes. Like, Mm -hmm. I know they're, uh, Kobe is a prime example. Kobe before some games, I mean, I I don't, I can't speak for every game. Mm -hmm. But I have seen some games where the team is shooting or whatever, and then Kobe's just on the chair. Sitting, mm-hmm. maybe dribbling between his legs, mm-hmm. but just like looking zoned, zoned in. out, yeah. And it's like that level of like, because I mean, you Kobe, Kobe again, prime example with this. He puts in the work off the court, on the court, Crazy. before games though. Yeah. So when you're talking about somebody who's like yourself, putting in, you know, wakes up and practices, and or in Kobe's case, wakes up and works out. And then goes to the uh, to the court and practices just threes from the left hand side of the of the key, or like just free throws, or just layups. You know, like you're just doing the motion so much that when you're when it's game time, or in your case, game time would be Showtime. when you're at a show. Yeah. yeah, you're so confident in what you're about to do that it's not a let me make sure I'm good. It's a let me make sure mentally I'm calm. So that I'm just flowing through the kit. Or in Kobe's case, flowing through the ball. Yes, exactly. That's, that's, that's an insane next level technique. I guess. And that's a good indicator. Because I've never recognized that, but it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it, but I've never recognized it. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to like look into. And I'm at that point in my life. 808 burp? Ooh, yep. Yeah, with these new mics, that's going to be an 808. You're going to hear it. And it's perfect because he's a musician on the podcast, so he just threw an 808 out at you guys. (laughs) I can't (laughs) wait to hear it back, too. It wasn't like an insane burp. There we go. That might be an 808 burp. Absolutely. All right. We'll do a third one. (laughs) Yes. Just keep them coming. Skrillex. (laughs) Okay, what I was going to say is um, I'm tapped into this this way of thinking right now. I know you are as well. Um, and there's, it's, it sounds like so much shit that spiritual sounds so egotistical, but there's like layers to life and ways of looking at life and thinking about, about things and and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, what I was going to, the example I was going to give is before a show, go to a show and look at the performer or whoever you came there to see before the actual event, before the game, before the show, before uh, whatever it is, before the presentation, mm-hmm. and look at what they do beforehand. That, that's what I'd like tapping into, and that's why I'll study UFC fighters and seeing how they train, and seeing, and a lot of them are like the best ones are spiritual, and the best ones are 
they have their mental down. Is Connor spiritual? Very spiritual. Really? Yeah. The way he talks. Connor studies uh, the law of attraction and manifestation, and he ah, says, "Ah, yes, yes, yes." One yes. of his favorite quotes of mine is, um, "If you can think it and you have the confidence enough to speak it, it will happen." Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And it did. And it did. Time and time again, until fi I mean, there uh, with fighting, there's there's a point where age defeats confidence mm -hmm. and ability. Mm -hmm. So. But it's a mindset, and it's like it's true. Um, and 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 fighting specifically. It's like a lot of shit goes down before the fights. It's like in fighting, you'll be sitting at the the press conference or whatever, and and um, and Connor. First of all, his it, think about his the way he sits Just as a his whole. Presence, yeah. yeah, like like the, the one guy's like this, like sitting down at the table, and Connor's like this, like calm as fuck, but sitting with an elite posture, and it's like nothing's like facing. Like a fucking gorilla. Yeah, like a gorilla, just ready to fight, and his 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 stare is insane. And he's sitting there like this. He's like, he'll put the mic up to his to his face and be like, uh, he's like, I'm about to wreck this motherfucker. I'm going to going to send him down to the canvas in the second round, four four minutes whatever, like four minutes in, mm -hmm. give an exact time, and the fact that he can set that goal and then calmly execute through the whole match, and at that moment, like imagine where his mind is mm -hmm. when it's like four minutes into the second round, and he's like, and Just he a green light. Yep, exactly. In his mind, he's like, all right, this is it. Let's go. With the Aldo fight, that was crazy. He told him the exact hit he was gonna hit him with, mm -hmm. and sent to the floor within the first ten seconds of the yeah. of, of the of the match. And it's like so, seeing somebody before they actually do the act and mm -hmm. their mindset, where they are, how they act. Like if you go to a basketball game, look at each of the players. I know I love Curry. Curry is, I think Kobe's my favorite NBA player of all time, but Steph Curry is debatably or maybe not debatably the goat. And I look at yeah. yeah, and I look at his approach to practice and pregame, and it's like he's he's kind of different than Kobe. Kobe said that he practices like it's game time every time, mm -hmm. so he's like full intensity going all out. As to where Curry, I see him like skipping around and like smiling and laughing, mm -hmm. and like just like chilling like nonchalantly, and then he'll like shoot and like swishes in or whatever, mm -hmm. and then so he's like part of the beginning. He's like. He's like so relaxed and casual and loose. And same with Connor when he walks into the ring. He's like this. You got that strut. You got the strut. Like mm -hmm. he's like just so confident and loose. That's another indicator. Are you stiff when you're when you're operating or when you're doing what you're doing? Or are you loose and you're and you're confident enough to like take up space or whatever? So yeah. so Curry's doing that. Curry's like skipping down, like loose as fuck, takes a shot, swishes it, and then he locks in intense and he's like he's got his trainer and he's like dribbling dribbling a basketball. Catch the tennis ball, throw it back, cross it over, catch the tennis ball, throw it back, and it's like very intense. Mm -hmm. Like it's high intensity training. And then he puts the ball back. He's like walking around casual again. Like, oh, behind the back, through the legs, switch over to the left side, lay up like off the very tippy top of the backboard, swish down in. Mm -hmm. And like, what? Yeah. And he'll like throw a ball mad high in the air and like bounce, swish in the mat. And it's yeah. like, the Are you yeah. God? The, le the <laughs> level that he's on is crazy. And, like, he's actually, I don't know if you've seen this. He's, uh, he actually has the pregame ritual uh, where he's, he goes off into the bleachers. Oh! Yeah. And just hucks a shot or I think he, he, he shoots a perfect form three <laughs> from, like, in the stands. Like, not, like, courtside. He's literally going into the hallway, up a flight of stairs, back out and just... Every every time, and it's one shot. I've, I've never seen I've never seen a video of Curry where it's like, oh, I need another one. He mm -hmm. literally br goes up with one ball and just, yeah, and just fucking runs, run, yeah, ah, celebrating, run. yeah, just like he's having fun with it. And that's really like that. That's obvious. Like that's honestly, in my opinion, how anybody doing anything that they're passionate about, that's how you should approach it every single time. You should never. It should never be a thing where you're doing something out of out of necessity. Mm. It's I'm doing this cuz I want to. I love, love it. it. Yeah. And like when you have that type of personality behind what you're doing, it shows in whatever you're doing. And that's honestly like the best thing. Like when you find that and that's a, that's the thing that's hard in my opinion is finding that one thing. Finding that one thing is probably like if you if you didn't exist at all. Mm -hmm. This might not exist. This this podcast might cuz like 
I was at a point where I was doing another podcast and I wasn't happy with the quality of content okay. and I wasn't happy about the topics that we were talking about. And I, I just wasn't happy in general. It was like something that I was doing to just go through the motions. Like I, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. And then after having the conversation with Pat, the one time I realized I wasn't happy in life in general, like as a human being, like I literally like up until that point, I was confident. But then when I talked to Pat and Pat came on the podcast and talked about spirituality, I genuinely had a moment where I was like, I'm not happy with anything about me. Like as a person, dope. Like my, my self-confidence is top notch. Like I, I and, and you know, kind of egotistical, I guess to say, but, no, fuck that shit. No. but, my my self confidence is top notch. Like I don't think that there's. I don't I don't think anyone is better than me. I think I'm the best. Yeah, always. I think you should. I think um, you should think that. But in regards to life, I was at a point where I was like, I'm going through the motions, and I'm not, I'm not doing what. I feel like I should be doing. Like it, it almost hit me like. And it was uh, Kevin Gates actually talked about this on a. Uh, an interview, I was, I didn't know what my purpose was. And Kevin Gates in an interview said, I'm not going to die. And the guy that was interviewing was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, it's crazy to say, but I'm not going to die. Have you seen that podcast? I just know or what that gonna, I just interview. Know what I've, I've, I've heard people say that before. Yeah. So, and he's like, what do you mean you're not going to die? He's like, I was put here for a purpose mm -hmm. and I'm not going to die until I fulfill that purpose. And then with me, it was almost the same realization minus the I'm not going to die part. Um, but it was like, I was die. put here for something and I'm not fulfilling that something. And that's why it's eating me alive right now. And I felt like I explained to you, um, it felt like I had a, like there was a spring inside of me that was real tight, yeah. tight, tight. A lot of tension. And like, I was like something, there's something that's going to release this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to like have that outlet mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to have. And when me and you had the conversation, you were like, why don't you just do a podcast on your own about what you want to talk about because you mm -hmm. obviously have a passion in something mm -hmm. but you're not talking about it right now and i'm like ah, and it was hard for me to even do that because right? there were so many th like so many wheels or like pieces that i had to like get rid of to make room for this one but since making room for this one i've genuinely never been happier and it's thank you life bro that's what life is about i feel like the meaning of life is happiness at least personally? One hundred percent, absolutely. If you're not happy in life, what are you like? What are you doing? You know I'm what I'm enjoying saying? It. I do know what you're saying because I've had that. I, I I cried in my car the other day having that realization. I was like, damn, I feel genuinely happy as fucking life, and that's got to be the meaning of life. The meaning of life I used to think was success, like success, achieving whatever at your craft, like crossing off the goals. No. That's not the meaning of life. The meaning of mm. life is happiness, whatever that may be. You you don't have to be here to be happy. You can be right here. Yeah. Happiness is in yourself. Mm -hmm. Happiness comes from within. Like you already have happiness. Yeah. You just need to dust off the vase or whatever and like look inside of it and like oh, there it is. You had it the whole time. You just were covering it up by yeah. the day to day and thinking, Oh, this is what I have to do. Mm -hmm. But you have happiness already. Just unleash it, unlock it yeah. by genuinely connecting with the you not not Michael Servigliano but you yeah exactly you know, that deep deep down spirit mm -hmm. and debatably the spirit moves on to another body and this and that whatever yeah, exactly. but like you not the the body that you're inhabiting and it sounds so hippie and spiritual but no but I mean he, I mean Eckhart even talks about that in the power of now Eckhart Tolle yeah mm -hmm. it's crazy uh, the Power of Now is one of the greatest books in the world. Absolutely. It's one of the most powerful books in the world. Absolutely. That, I, I, I put a few of those practices into, I implemented a few of them. One that, uh, again, I talked about it with Pat, um, the one where you you actually like get present through breathing techniques and focus on something, right? Anything. And it was I was in the gym and I, I was on a stair climber doing cardio and I was like, let me see if there's any legitimacy, legitimacy to this bullshit. Cause I, I, I didn't, it sounded, it sounded like, it sounded like bullshit. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, sit there, breathe, whatever. I did it. Genuinely did it. And I just remembered this aura around the plant that I was focusing on.
just this aura, this glow that this plant, this, this like withering plant in the corner, this withering fern in the corner of the gym. I was just on the cardio machine. I hit the breathing techniques. I got present. I wasn't thinking about anything. And then I was like, I started focusing on the plant. I'm like, that's a beautiful plant. And I was saying, that's a, that's a beautiful plant, but it was a withering plant. Mm -hmm. But when I was speaking that and doing the breathing techniques and being present, that plant began to emit an aura and a glow yeah. that I've never seen up until that point. And that, in my opinion, just a theory that I had, when people say that, that children look at the world from a different perspective, that perspective is, I, I, I believe that's what they're talking about because children aren't concerned with the other people's opinions. They're not concerned with what's going to happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. They're just having fun right now. And that perspective opens up so many doors to everything. Mm -hmm. And once you can change your perspective and do that, there's no limit to what you can do. Yeah, exactly. Just being able to change your perspective and the way that you look at everything. Yeah. And it's absolutely insane how effective this shit is, but people are so turned off to the spirituality, to spirituality as a whole. Because like you said, sounds hippie. You're a hippie. You're, yo, you're spiritual. Yeah. Buddhism, Taoism, hippie. It's yeah. like, you, I guess you could understand it, but at the same time, it's like, these practices are actually beneficial. And you implement them daily, like wh whether it's drumming or whatever, mm -hmm. daily. Mm -hmm. And it's so effective. Yeah. They talk about that's so powerful. They talk about that in one of the books I've read, something about Buddhism or the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And um, talks about how when you can actually, so it might be even the power of now too, I forgot, but it's when you can slow down. Like people usually, they want to get from point A to point B. And they go. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but you didn't notice there was a tree at point, like, A.5. A mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. B, it's like, there's, like, a gorgeous green tree there. But, like, while you're walking or driving from point A to point B, you drive past that tree, and the tree's like, oh, you, you, maybe, you, might be, you might look out your window and glance at it and be like, like oh, there's a tree. Or a tree. And, like, you're gone. But, like, when you actually... <laughs> oh, let's word say... Tree. <laughs> yeah, word, <laughs> a tree. Okay, I know, what, I know what a tree is. Or let's say for, the better, for a better explanation, you're walking. Because mm. you have a little more time when you're walking. You're walking on your way to wherever you're going. Maybe you're getting coffee in the morning. And you do your, your morning walk to, the, to get coffee. And you're like, cool, yeah, there's that tree. And you're going. And then, now let's say you implement it through the, the, the practice of what you were talking about, which is slowing down your breath and slowing down your actual walk itself and enjoying the stroll. And Buddhism talks about this, the mindfulness in walking. Um, and so, so you, you're mindful and you're walking and you're walking slowly and you see the tree this time and it takes on a different shade. Like you said, you saw a different aura. Mm -hmm. So you're walking and now you can actually even stop at right in between A and B and really look at the tree and you notice that it has a certain color, a different color. It's not just green. Because when you walked by it before and you looked at it, it was green. Yeah, now just because that's what you're, you're told. Like, yeah, now you stop and you're like, it's like a, it's a much lighter, beautiful green that has it's th it's darker towards the top and it's a little lighter towards the bottom half of it and you can truly appreciate it and it does sound hippie and 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 that's what i hate about mainstream opinion is like anything that's spiritual or working on yourself is kind of like stomped out on the floor and it's like that's whack that's not cool mm -hmm. it's cool to not care and 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 that's what leads to depression yeah. it's the mainstream media that's why a lot of not like caring. younger kids are depressed too it's like it's it's not cool to uh, to to view life like that. It's too hippie. It's mm -hmm. it's too corny, but it's like that's that's going to unlock your true happiness. Absolutely. When you can truly be present. And for anybody listening who um, hasn't read the Power of Now, I suggest that you do first of all. But second of all, to sum it up, I figured out a good way to summarize it. And I figured this out before I even read the book. This this sentence I'm about to say, um, or this mm, rather paragraph. But this, this summarizes the book really nicely, I think. So, depression is living in the past. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is living in the future. Mm -hmm. And calmness and happiness is living in the now, living mm -hmm. in the present. Because right here in this current moment, there's nothing bad happening. We're literally just lounging in a music studio 
with our drinks, just so relaxed, just talking to each other on your podcast. We're talking about spirituality, positivity, hard work, um, and I'm your guest on the po- on the podcast, and we're talking about my life as well and how how happy I am in my life. And it's like nothing bad's happening at this very moment. So exactly. why would you be depressed? Why would you be anxious? Just calm down, and we're right here. Yeah. And that's when you operate the best too. That's why people before the game or before the performance calm down because it's when you operate the best. Mm-hmm. And and it's so powerful. But that's that's a, a, a nice summary of the power of now. And um, I think that's my number one advice in life as well is that like if you're ever feeling depressed or a little sad, it's more likely than not because you're thinking of an event that already happened that you can't go back and change. So thinking about it's not going to help at all. Mm-hmm. But you're thinking about that and you're dwelling on the past and you're like, damn, I'm sad because I should have done that differently. But you can't, so why are you thinking like that? Or oh, that that happened and I wish that never happened. It's like you can't control that. That shaped no. who you are today. Exactly. Do you love who you are today? Well, yeah, but that one thing, no, fuck that. You like who you are today, right? Cool, so let's let's operate from here and keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. And it's like, fuck that shit. That shaped who you are today. You like who you are today. Yeah. So it's like, okay, like people like to try to come back to their past traumas. And it's like, mm, uh-uh, that's no. not who you are. That's that's a thing that happened in your life. But yeah. you are who you are today, which is a pretty dope person. Absolutely. And it's like, if that didn't happen, you might not be this person. You might be, you wouldn't be. an entitled fuck. Yeah, exactly. Or whatever. And it's like, for anxiety, it's like, oh, I got a doctor's appointment in two weeks and... We're gonna we're gonna be making an incision in my arm, and I'm scared of razors. And it's like fuck, and you're like your heart starts beating faster, and you, well, hold on, you're you're living in the future. Mm. Control your breathing first of all, because your your body's going into fight or flight mode because you're so anxious thinking about the future. Yeah. Control your breathing. Oh, just that first breath feels so much better. As you slow down your breathing, that's a superpower in and of itself, slowing mm. down your breathing. Because now you're telling your inner workings of your body that everything's okay. There's nothing to worry about because you're breathing so slowly. It's almost like you're sleeping. Mm-hmm. And now you come back to the present moment and nothing bad is happening right now. Exactly. It's a fucking superpower. Those two mm-hmm. combined, the breathing and the living in the now and like understanding that when you are depressed or sad, you're in the past. And when you're anxious or like really like jittery, Absolutely. In the future. It's like a superpower. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I feel like um, perspective has a lot to do with it as well. There was a, there was a study done um, with a, two, two groups. Both were running, I believe it was a track meet. Not 100% sure. But I believe it was a track meet, and there were two groups. Um, both were, like, anxiety-ridden groups of people. And one group went through a training where they had a, a mantra of sorts where when they went in, when it was about to be game time or, you know, track meet time, whatever, they were told to think of the anxiety that they were having as, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Yeah, that's why I'm feeling like this. I'm excited. And the, the shift in perspective made it so that these, this group of runners performed far better than the other group of runners. No drugs were given. No advantage was given other than a perspective shift. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And that's, a, that, I mean, that's, that's a, like you said, a, a huge thing in what you were saying. You change the way you look at it. You're not, you're living now. You're not living in the future. You're not living in the past. What happened in the past, you can't change. So why worry about it? How are you going to change it? Mm-hmm. You can't. And that's also like stoicism, I believe, in a sense, yeah. where it's like the glass broke. You could get pissed, but the glass won't fix itself yeah. if you're pissed. Yeah. Stoicism, just that, that scenario itself, like the glass breaking, it's like another superpower is understanding that you can't control what happens, but you can control how you react or even better respond to what happens. Like Exactly. With the glass and it breaks, you can get pissed at it. You can, you, well, I think it's, there's so many things you can do, but like mm-hmm. for, for a more common folk sense, it's like you can get mad that it broke or you can accept that it broke and be like okay clean it up and like move on with your day that mm-hmm. that happened okay don't let it ruin your day that's so minuscule so and the cool part about stoicism is you already expected the glass to break anyways mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't assume it was going to break but you were like ready if the glass if the glass falls and break like i'm just gonna sweep it up you're in that mindset already and the glass fell so it's like 
All right, like where's the like you? The first thing you think is where's the broom and the dustpan. You the first thing you think is that. Yeah. Instead of the first thing you're thinking like, oh shit, no! Like, what if somebody steps on that? No, uh, uh, get the dog, get the dog. Um, and now you're like so stressed out. Mm-hmm. Stoicism is just like, Shh. all right, where's the broom? Like you're already thinking of the solution. Exactly. That's why stoicism is goaded. You know what? What um, obviously with you learning about and studying all these different religions and um, what would they be called? Uh, spiritual practices. Yeah. Yeah. Of them all, which one do you? And obviously, this is going to be a very difficult thing to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm-hmm. Which one do you resonate with the most?